morning. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good. Good. I like it. Well, I'm glad to be here this morning and to share in worship with you all here at Brookbeat Congregational Church. I'm Pastor Liz DeWeese. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm just grateful that we can all be in this space on this somewhat chilly, kind of rainy morning. But what a beautiful um, morning where we can share in uh, the nature of God's creation. So this morning, as we prepare ourselves for worship, I invite you to know that everyone in the sanctuary and everyone who meets us online, no matter who you are or where you are on your journey, you are welcome here. But not only are you welcome here, we're working to create um, a culture of belonging. And so we hope that you can find that you belong here, find the place where you belong among us. And um, if, if we have some ways we can improve, we're always open to the, uh, to the suggestions. So we appreciate that. As we continue in our worship experience, I invite you to prepare yourself for worship by figuring out how you're going to be present for this experience. How are you going to put yourself fully in this moment and let yourself not be too distracted by the things that are happening in the world around us? Now, don't hear me wrong. That doesn't mean we ignore the world while we're here. We bring with us our whole selves, and if that means that we're heartbroken about something, if it means that we're distressed or we're worried or we're excited about something, we bring it with us into this space to be present with us in the community with God. But if there are those things that are going to draw your attention away from the experience, I invite you to take a moment and envision where they can wait for you until worship is over. I like to envision them waiting outside the window back there because I can see it very well and it's outside. And I can say to them, not yet. <laughs> Every time they kind of start to creep in, I can say, oh, not yet, not yet. I'm here. And when I'm finished here, then I will be ready. But until then, I want to be in this place in this time with these people and our God to worship, to experience the holy, and to be refreshed and refilled and renewed. So I'll be ready. So I invite you to figure out how you can envision those distractions waiting for you until we're done. As you are able and as you choose to, I invite you to rise in your own fashion for the call to worship. From the rising of the sun to its setting, God, God speaks, speaks to us, us and suffers us. us. God gathers us in covenant. God God glory shines forth. Let, Let us worship, worship God. God. Please remain standing as we uh, join together singing number 423. Great is your faithfulness.
Please be seated as we join together in our opening prayer. Mighty God, you call to us. You call to the heavens and to the earth in covenant. And so we call to you. Be present as we worship. Gather us that we may hear your voice and respond to your ways of righteousness. We pray in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll sing verses 1 and 2, number 403. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust this living way. that we have been blessed with by Christ, um, by our God, and to remember that it is ours to share, that there is plenty to share with the community around us. And the practice of sharing that peace with one another is a practice then that we can take into the world as we share peace with the world to bring God's peace through our actions. So I invite you this morning as we gather together to share peace with one another. And um, as we continue to be careful with one another, I invite you to do that without touching as best you can um, and uh, to offer peace in the best ways that you know how to do. Let us share the peace of Christ. in the life of the church. Um, Wednesday of this week, uh, we, the, we are partnering with Holy Trinity Community Church. Um, they are hosting a Valentine's dinner, potluck dinner, that would invite everyone to come and uh, bring a little something to share. I'm sure it will be delicious and lovely. Um, and that will be followed by an Ash Wednesday service that we'll be sharing together. Um, I'll be bringing the message, but we'll be partnering together as community uh, to share in that special service to begin the season of Lent. So I hope you'll make some extra time to come and participate in that service. Dinner begins at six o'clock, the service at seven o'clock, um, and we hope to see you there. This Friday is Room in the Inn. Um, is this our last scheduled one? Yes. Yeah, so this is our last scheduled one. Do we have spots we still need to fill? Yes. Okay, so please take a moment uh, if you can and um, look at that list when we when you head out for fellowship. Uh, oh. Yeah, it'll be posted out by the uh, Coffee Fellowship. Yes, okay. Are there, is there more you want to say about it? Um, no, just uh, last chance for, for this winter. Yeah. And, uh, to make the most of it. And, uh, last chance to help some a, of our unhoused folks. It's a fun way to serve yeah. and, uh, and give yeah. to uh, people who uh, really need, need and appreciate uh, our help and our, our attention. Great. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. So, um, all right. So that's Room in the Inn this Friday and Saturday. Um, other things that are coming up in the life of the church on Friday the 23rd, uh, we'll be hosting a game night here at 6 p.m. So, um, Hope you'll come. That should be a fun fellowship and um, a good opportunity to just spend some time together and uh, get to know each other and play. I love that, right? 
Isn't that a good thing to do in community, to just play? Yeah, okay, cool. So show up if you can. Uh, we would really love that. Um, and then uh, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to um, Project Cure and the Poor People's Campaign Rally that are coming up on March the 2nd. Uh, at the end of March is Easter, and um, in the midst of April, we'll have our open mic night. Coffee House is coming back. Uh, Fellowship is going to be hosting that, and then our garden, new garden dedication service. So just things to kind of put on your calendar. Make sure that you're aware that they're coming up so you don't miss them. Um, and uh, are there any other things in the life of the church? Yes, please, Robbie. I guess technically this is not life of the church, but um, because we are a church that cares about our society. We have a primary coming up on March 5th. Early voting opens this Wednesday, the 14th. If you live in Davidson County, I know uh, two of the early voting sites are that are on this side of town are different, so be sure you pay attention to your folder about where the early voting is, if that's the way you choose to vote. That's the way I usually do it, it's easier. Um, and just, I was listening to a podcast where they were talking about the small percentage of people that vote in the primaries. There are a lot of elections that are decided at the primary level. There's a couple here in Davidson County that will be decided essentially the primary level, probably. So it is important to vote, even in the primary. Yeah, thank you so much. That's an important message and reminds me too that um, that there will be opportunities coming up on Tuesday of this coming week, uh, as well as, I get the sense that Tuesdays and Wednesdays are kind of, maybe even Thursdays, uh, but Tuesdays especially are days when uh, there is social action that's happening at the Capitol. Um, specifically, the Tennessee Equality Project has been organizing, but this coming Tuesday, um, there is a, a pretty large organ organized group of folks who are going all day long to the Capitol to speak up uh, for um, for um, comprehensive uh, words. Gun control is where I'm trying to go with that, but. Um, uh, so the, the idea that we could go for, for safety for our community um, and so if uh, there are some good bipartisan groups that are working together to try and influence our legislature on how to keep us safer in our community. Um, there have been, uh, in the last two weeks, there have been two uh, shootings in our community that have affected children. Um, to the uh, one that went to school at my daughter's school. Another um, was children who were at a middle school at night that sh probably shouldn't have been there. But um, the, but regardless, this kind of gun violence is unnecessary. It's un it's unreasonable. It's out of control, and we need to find ways to encourage our legislature to help us be safer as a community. So um, I have some feelings about that. Um, hopefully you do too. Uh, so that's a thing that's coming up. There are also some opportunities to um, speak to our legislature about uh, rights for LGBTQ people. And um, so if you're not seeing it on um, our calendar in, in church, it's because it happened quicker than I could get things to Lauren. But we will do our best to keep things on social media. We will do our best. If, if, you're, if you follow me on social media, you'll see things that I post. So if you're interested and you want to show up, Come find us, because um, uh, it's it's important that we use our voice um, to speak. Yeah. All right. If there are no other things happening in the life of the church, I would invite us to um, have just a moment, <laughs> since we have no children in in, in our sanctuary today. Uh, we'll take just a moment to focus on that mo that message. Um, just because they're not here doesn't mean they won't watch. So uh, it's always important to keep space in our, in our service for our time with children. Um, this morning, I'm gonna be talking about, we're gonna be reading from um, Mark's Gospel, and I'm gonna be talking about a time when Jesus was standing in front of his disciples, and all of a sudden he changed right in front of their eyes. He changed in a way that was really surprising. 
So I wonder if you've ever seen anything change right before your eyes. Like sometimes, there is fire, and then there's not, right? But then what happens? When we introduce fire again, is it changes before our eyes one more time. And there is light in a place where there wasn't before. Sometimes change happens and we're surprised by it. And it can be exciting. And we can get, I mean, yeah, sometimes it can be exciting. Sometimes change happens and it's scary. Um, sometimes change happens and it's sad. Sometimes change happens and it's hard. And sometimes it's all of those things all at once. Exciting, fun, scary, hard, sad, all at once. But change happens. The only way that we can grow as people is if we change. I imagine little people Little humans always being frustrated by not being able to reach the things that they want to reach. Do you all remember that? Not being able to reach the things you wanted to? And some of us still are challenged by that, right? <laughs> not always being able to reach the things we want to reach. But when we're little humans who, are, who know we're going to grow, right? We, are, we have this hope that someday I'm going to be big enough to get up and reach that thing that I want to reach. And, if, and even if I'm not, I'll be big enough and smart enough and strong enough to use the tools I need to get the thing that I need, even if that's a taller person that I call on to say, hey, come help me, <laughs> right? So we always want to be aiming towards the change of growth. But sometimes those changes are painful. Sometimes they are hard, even when we get excited about the day that we finally are able to reach the thing we were trying to reach all the time. That day comes and it's kind of like so super exciting, but then growth continues to happen and all of a sudden we don't even remember that that was a big deal to us anymore. Now I say all of these things about change because we're gonna be talking about change today and how change can happen sometimes to us and we have to deal with that. And sometimes we can learn about what the thing is that we want to change and we can move into it and shape that change in the way we want it to be. So God can help us with all of that. So would you say a prayer with me? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the one who changed before the disciples' eyes and taught them that change can happen in a moment. We ask that you would help us to be ready for the changes that will come. Help us to live into them and to shape them in a way that follows you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter nine, verses Two, three, nine. Six days after that, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain where they could be alone. And there Jesus was transfigured before their eyes. The clothes Jesus wore became dazzlingly white, whiter than any earthly bleach could make them. Elijah appeared to them as did Moses, and the two were talking with Jesus. Then Peter spoke to Jesus. Rabbi, he said, how wonderful it is for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what he was saying, so overcome were they all with awe. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, 
And there came a voice from out of the cloud. This is my beloved, my own. Listen to this one. Then suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the promised one had risen from the dead. God is still speaking. Would you pray with me? Make our hearts ready for the work ahead. Help us engage our curiosity with hope and trust in you and your promise. Strengthen our courage to let go of what of that which no longer serves your mission, even if it is hard to let go. Assure us with the hope of your promise and help us to see your movement among us. And may this word be a blessing for all who receive it. Amen. When I was in high school, I played trombone in the marching band. I was one of two girls who played trombone. Um, and uh, I played trombone from the time I was in sixth grade all the way through the 12th grade. Our school, our high school in Western Kentucky marched over a hundred members on the field at least every year. Um, we were very competitive throughout the region. The, Pride of Western Kentucky was the name of our band. I'm sure no one with ego had anything to do with that name. Um, but we were the pride of Western Kentucky. The Madisonville, Mar the Madisonville Hopkins Marching Maroons. That's, uh, I don't know why we were a color, we were a color but um, the Bowling Green Purples were, were also, were also a high school we marched against. So, um, we were very competitive throughout the region and we worked really hard to win lots of competitions. <clears throat> competitive marching band taught me discipline, and, but it also added to my complex relationship with perfectionism. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> when you compete, the goal is to win, right? And winning requires the best and the, being the best necessitates the closest thing to perfection one can reach and when it's a team sport, there is a need for everyone to do their part, to do their best, to be perfect on the field. I remember one year we went to state competition and um, Lafayette was the name of the high school that won a state competition every year in Kentucky at that point in the 90s. Um, and uh, they were a Lexington high school. I remember watching their show in the finals one year when I was probably a sophomore or junior in high school. We were watching from the stands. And there was a point at which they marched into a formation on the field where whoever had created this image created it such that when the, the band members were on the field, they, their shadows created perfect diamonds. And I was like, that is incredible. It just blew my mind that someone would think about the shadows being a part of the picture that was created by the people who were marching in place. But that's the level of perfection that we were aiming for. If anybody was out of line, those diamonds did not form, right? If anybody was not where they needed to be, those pictures didn't come together. So it's a team sport and it's important for everyone to do their part. If anyone messes up anything, it messes up for everyone. That's a lot of pressure to carry for someone who was only in the band because it's where all her friends were. <laughs> and if she left the band, she wouldn't have access to the same friend group anymore, which is everything when you're a teenager. There was more than one year that it was time for band camp that I spent an entire day crying before band camp started because I really didn't want to do band, but I didn't want to lose my friends. As I said though, our band worked hard to be competitive. 
We spent one week each summer in an intensive band camp, which meant all day long in the heat of the summer out on the asphalt, because that's where our practice field was. Lots of drink water, drink water, drink water, and lots of intensive marching placement, learning our music, making sure we were paying attention. Then once school started every Tuesday and every Thursday after school, at least two to three hours of, of practice, uh, rehearsal, and then several Wednesday, Wednesday afternoons, we would have sectional practices for just our section. And co competitions were every Saturday. Oh, and we would march for the football games. Oh, and we would march in parades as well when there were special events in town. And then on occasion, there would be national competitions that we would go to. We were busy and we worked hard. And there would often be moments in our rehearsals and practices when we had been working our little tails off to, to mark time and to get into place and to make sure that all of the lines were perfect and the intervals were perfect and everything was just right. And then the band director inevitably would go and run and stand up on top of the drum major's podium and would say to us, repeat after me, change is good. <laughs> and there would be a groan from our hundred piece band. And we would say, change is good. We would groan because we knew we were about to receive a new set of images changing our field spots and we were going to have to learn some new movements to get us to where we were going after having practiced perfection up to this point. When you have worked hard to learn and perfect one way of doing things, it is work. It is hard work sometimes to retrain your brain to learn a new way of doing things. Can I get an amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Sometimes it's just hard work having to train our brain to do something a new way. But change is good. But change can be hard. I've spent more than 20 of my 47 years learning about churches and why we became, why we have become smaller in our numbers and what we need to do to change that trajectory. I'm not, I haven't perfected it. <laughs> but it's not all my work either. But I have done a lot of work to understand it so that I can help churches figure out what we can do better. And none of these things that I've learned are foolproof. None of them are the magic pill, the magic program, the magic anything. There is no magic medicine, in fact, that we can take. There is no perfect program that we can implement, which is hard to hear because you want there to just be a thing that if we could just do that thing, then everything would be easy and it would go back to some kind of better, right? That's. That, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Here's what I learned. Church community, a church community is a system. And systems are built to maintain status quo. If a church wants to see a change in the way that we exist in the world, that church must embrace the change. Because the change is going to happen whether we name it, acknowledge it, and in, engage it, or we ignore it. It's going to happen anyway. It's just when a system is focused on the way we've always done things, or trying to ma maintain what we have always been while the world and our culture around us continues to change, we become irrelevant if we're so focused on staying the same while the world and culture around us changes. Change is certain, but do we want to let change happen to us or do we want to participate in the change in a way that we can shape the change that is happening? I hope there's a right answer to that, right? Yeah. 
If we want to break the status quo, we have to choose to change, which means we must name what's not working, and then we must actively, respectfully, prayerfully, with gratitude, let it go. And I mean that, prayerfully, with gratitude, respectfully, but actively, let it go and be finished with it and not feel guilt about the people who made it happen before us because we love them and we honor them by letting it go because it doesn't serve the ministry and the mission anymore. It doesn't hurt them to let it go. And then we must not only develop a plan for living into God's mission for Brookmead, but we must be sure that all that we choose to do from here on out aligns with that mission that God is calling us to, including making sure that any service we offer is tested against those who benefit from that service to assure that what we are putting our energy into is something that is needed and wanted and will actually be of service to those who receive it. How many times have you been a part of a group, some kind of social group, I'm not just talking about church, but some kind of social group who means so well, they really want to do something really good for the community? Have you ever done this? And they, they come up with an idea, and they, they put it all together, and they put all of their energy and resources into the idea to serve a certain thing, to help people, and then the people don't show up. And then the group who put all that energy and effort and resource into this thing that they did, they're so proud of themselves, but nobody showed up, and then they feel bad, and then they're angry at the people who didn't show up, because how could you not want the thing that we did for you? What step did we skip? We skipped a big one in the beginning. We didn't ask, do you want this thing? Do you need this thing? Is there a way that we can do it that will actually serve you and help you? So often we forget to ask if what we're offering is actually going to be of service to the people we need to, we mean to offer it to. So it's an important step I often see churches skip in the service that they offer. And all of this has to be done with intention, on purpose. We have to choose it. Otherwise, we'll just keep doing the same thing we've always done and then wonder why we aren't changing, right? Why is change happening to us? Change is hard, but change is good. Change is growth. And growth will mean that some things will die. But imagine what can be born out of what we let go. This Sunday is the last Sunday of the season after Epiphany, and traditionally the lectionary has us transition from Revelation, where something is revealed about Jesus all through the season of Epiphany, to reflection as we move into Lent with this Sunday of transfiguration. This passage of Jesus taking a hike up a mountain with three of his first called disciples, and when they reach the pinnacle, Jesus begins to change before their very eyes, and suddenly the law and the prophets are before all of them in person with Moses and Elijah. Moses, whose law it is that is the um, um, Torah and Elijah, who represents the, all of the prophets. And the disciples are amazed, in awe, overwhelmed by this thing that happens before them. Peter wants to hold on to this moment by, come on, we'll build you some tabernacles. We'll build you some little, you know, tents, something to let us know that this amazing thing happened so that anybody who comes to this spot will know that this is where this amazing thing happened. But Peter, of course, is ignored because he's kind of speaking out of fear, a little bit out of, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like I should say something. So we don't hear any more from Peter when all of a sudden a cloud comes over and shades the disciples' eyes, and out of the cloud comes a voice that says, this is my beloved, my own. Listen to this one. I imagine for a moment what it must have been like to not be able to see in front of you and all of a sudden to not just hear but to feel 
a voice speak in a way that you know it is inside of you and outside of you and to hear these words that are uncertain but certain at the same time this is my beloved my own listen to this one and then the voice finishes speaking and the cloud disappears and jesus leads the disciples back down the mountain and as they are walking down the mountain jesus says to them now don't tell anybody what happened at least not until the promised one rises from the dead And I'm imagining for a moment that Peter, James, and John are like, what is he talking about? (laughs) Okay, we won't say anything. This passage is often referred to as as the moment when Jesus turns his face toward Jerusalem. It is the moment in this narrative when Jesus knows he must His ministry has shifted. He must go to the most dangerous place for a prophet to go and speak truth to power. Jesus knows that this ministry he has been leading into growth with the help of his disciples must shift its focus. Jesus' mission to change hearts must face the power structures of this time, and it must empower the people to know that they can change their system if they choose it. If they want to live into God's realm where there is enough for everyone, if they want to see good news for the poor come to life, if they want to experience release of the captive, they have to go to the center of the power structure and speak truth to power. And Jesus knew this work would probably get him killed. He knew what was coming because he knew that the people with power would be angry. They would be unsettled. They would not like the idea of their power being evened out for others. But for Jesus, it was worth it to change the hearts of the powerful. It was worth it, even to chance death. Change is good. Change is hard work. Change will involve letting go, and some of that will feel like death. Something new will be born. The cycle of creation is born out of destruction. Metamorphosis is messy and painful, but the butterfly is evidence of the beauty that can be born from the work of change. Jesus changed before their very eyes as a preparation for the change that would come. Change, y'all, change is here at Brookmead. And some of it is going to feel awesome and amazing and make you so excited. And some of it is going to hurt. And some of it is going to feel like, do we have to? But I liked it that way. But if we're going to grow, yeah. So what are we going to do to shape the change that is here together? Amen. As we reflect on the word we have received, I invite you as you're able and as you choose to, to join in singing our hymn of response. We have come at Christ's own bidding. Number 182.
invite you then to join me as we go to God in prayer together. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, God of peace, God of hope, God of encouragement, God of courage, we come to you today and we ask that you would bless each one who is facing difficult choices, challenges in life that may be about grief, they may be about disease, they may be about relationship. But we pray, oh God, that as we face the challenges that are in our lives, that you would be present and make yourself known so that we can be assured, not just by your promise, but by an experience of presence. Even if that comes in the form of a friend, we are grateful, oh God, for the ways that you walk through our lives, that you move through our lives with us. And we ask for your encouragement when we feel overwhelmed by the brokenness in this world, when we feel overwhelmed by violence and war and disease and sadness, when we feel overwhelmed by the change that is around us, we need your encouragement and we are grateful, God, when we can experience that you are there, showing us in moments, glimpses of your presence, when we experience joy, when we know that together our voices are louder than when we are alone, when we can see the movement of your peace through the actions of love that come through people who are seeking to shine light in this world and bring equity, justice to all. God, we pray for this, but we ask that you would lead us to be active in making it happen. We pray this morning for those who are struggling with mental health and addiction, that you would help them to find the resources that are around them. We pray for those who struggle with um, issues of uh, end of life, who feel hopeless. And we pray that you will help hope to be present, to bring confidence and encouragement. Let us each be a light in someone's darkness. God, we give thanks for the ways in which joy brings us a smile and encouragement and hope. We ask that you would hear all of this in the name, and we pray it together in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God's gifts to creation and to us are abundant and ever new. Entrusted with creation's care and with care for one another, we share our gifts out of our own abundance.
Let us pray. Mighty God, you live and you do not leave us. With these gifts, we do not leave each other, but use them in mutual support. Bless those who receive and benefit from these gifts. May they know your presence with them. With these gifts, our prayers rise up to you. Amen. If you would remain standing in uh, body, spirit, as we join together and sing number 593, lift every voice and sing. Okay, sure. I've been asked to say just a little bit about this song. And today, millions of Americans, millions of people around the world will be watching the Super Bowl. And just before the Super Bowl starts, this song will be sung. Today it is going to be sung by Andra Day. And it was written in the late 1800s as a hymn for black people coming out of slavery. And it is considered the black national anthem. Today I like to consider it as our national anthem because it means so much to all of us you know, February is considered Black History Month, but every month is Black History Month. And that is the problem that we have in this country today. The people today who will be dismissing the singing of this song will be the same people today who will be angry that Taylor Swift might be at the ball game. Those are the same people who do not want us to, to not unite together. But this song is to unite us, and I would like for us to sing it, the two verses together first. You go one verse and then right back into the second verse. I'm going to sing it slowly so you can understand the words to it. And then I hope you get to see it tonight at the Super Bowl. And I hope I get to see Taylor Swift. <laughs>
May you go renewed in spirit. May you go rising to new life. May you go with God's mantle of mercy and blessing of peace upon you, now and forever. Amen. Amen.